Welcome to the Common Babbler podcast. I am uh, Kalyan Chakravarti. I'm an associate professor in biological science and chemistry at Kriya University, the School of Interorgan Arts and Sciences. The podcast discusses science pedagogy and uh, with a focus on how to effectively communicate science in a classroom, in an undergraduate classroom. We are a group of science enthusiasts, communicators, teachers, and researchers. And we, our common interest is understanding and improving science teaching practices. This podcast will not be a compilation of classroom teaching. Rather, we'll have uh, with us experts and practitioners and uh, we'll discuss the different ways in which the science teaching, classroom teaching of science can be enriched. Um, to suggest additional topics, uh, please enter them in the comments section below and also be sure to like any comments suggesting topics that you are interested in. We will shape the content of future podcasts accordingly. So this will be a chance to uh, do this interactively. Uh, <clears throat> our guest today is uh, Professor K. S. Vishwanathan. Professor K. S. Vishwanathan is a visiting faculty of chemistry at Kriya University, School of Interurban Arts and Sciences. Professor Vishwanathan is an expert in uh, molecular spectroscopy. He is a PhD. He got his PhD from Vanderbilt University. Uh, his research interest spans uh, the areas of molecular conformation and weak non-covalent interactions, which are extremely important in chemistry, physics, and biology. Professor Vishwanathan uh, um, joined the was part of the Indira Gandhi Center for uh, Atomic Research (IGCAR) in. Um, Kalpakkam, that's a department of Atomic Energy Laboratory. Then uh, he was at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Mohali, as a professor of chemistry. And he has many uh, papers and books on the, uh, especially about non-covalent interactions and uh, specializing in infrared spectroscopy, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And also he had made fundamental breakthroughs about um, how to increase the uh, signal to noise, the sensitivity of the spectroscopic technique, uh, and um, I think about the matrices that uh, that can be used uh, for um, for the molecules to be studied. He has read. Uh, he has uh, many papers in this uh, in this topic. He has a book, Analytical Methods, Interpretation, Identification, and Quantification, with uh, R. Gopalan uh, from University Press, published in two thousand eighteen. Welcome, Professor Vishwanathan. It's a pleasure Thank to you. have you here. <clears throat> Thank you for having me over. This effort is independent of our affiliations and responsibilities in terms of teaching and research at Korea University. And um, I mean, you also mentioned that you have a you have interest in also in music and cricket, if I understand oh, yes, correctly. Yeah. Yes. So, do you find uh, any connection between chemistry or science in general, or the spectroscopy in in particular, possibly with music? or maybe with cricket. Yeah, there are two aspects to this. The first one is important that you have interests other than your major area of study. So if you are a researcher and a teacher in chemistry, it is extremely important that you also have other areas that are interesting, that you are interested in, so that you develop a personality that is more wholesome. And this is something I tell the students all the time, that while it is very important to study well, it is also very, very important not just to study well that you must have interests other than studies that uh, help you in your, in, your, in your progress. For one thing, having other interests, I think, enhances your own uh, competence in your core area because it gives you a good break. You go into uh, other areas. You see people who are very different from your major area of work. And that enhances your personality. That also gives you a good break from your actual work and so, so that when you come back to it, you know, you're that much recharged. So it's very important to have other areas. I, I especially like games a lot. I play. I have, I have been playing cricket, table tennis, tennis, and so on. <clears throat> I enjoy music. I tried my hand at Murdangam for a while, but not more for more than three years. But it still taught me many things. And I think uh, that was a useful uh, digression from what I normally do. Whether it has helped me in chemistry, yes. Because very often when you have to teach some concepts in chemistry and you try to draw examples, I find that I can very quickly draw examples from games or uh, music and so on to be able to teach them the major uh, points that I'm trying to discuss in chemistry itself. So, so to that extent, yes, it's helped me a lot. But more than anything, it's helped me to stay charged. It has helped me to provide the right digression 
from a major area of work, which I think is very important. So that's a very interesting, uh, uh, Vish. Um, so uh, I think one thing that you mentioned is that it helps to connect with the students, to have like a different subject to talk about, yeah. whether it's cricket yeah. or it's uh, some other games. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you very quickly connect with students, you know, if you show interest in other areas, because see, not all the students are really keen on pursuing the subject that you're teaching eventually. They mm -hmm. may have other interests. And if you can engage them in a variety of other interests too, they come back to studying your own subject in a much better fashion because they connect to you, they see you as a good friend. And, and the discussion that you have in areas other than chemistry actually helps them in studying the chemistry topic that you're discussing in a much better way. And I think that connecting with students is very easy if you yourself have interest in other areas other than uh, your major area of work. So I believe that uh, I think in your career, you worked at a government laboratory, mm -hmm. Department of Atomic Energy Laboratory, in which the students have already committed to chemistry. They are already chosen yeah. their career in chemistry, probably joined the PhD program. <coughs> you have taught in Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, where students have already joined a science program. They are but undergraduate students now. And Korea is a liberal arts university. So do you think that the presentation of the subject changes in these different settings? Surely it does, because when you talk to people who are already committed to doing science, you are not left with the burden of having to uh, you know, encourage them mm. to do science, because they've already chosen that. So now it is your responsibility to make the topic very interesting so that they stay in science, and then you guide them or encourage them to follow certain paths which will help them to choose their areas of interest within science itself. So that's basically what it is. Uh, whereas in a liberal arts and science institute like ours, you also have to enthuse them into considering science as a topic in the first place. Right. And therefore, that is a challenge. It's a very pleasant challenge, in fact. And you will find that when you talk to... And, and that is something that you have to take very seriously because students have come here... Uh, not having really decided what they want to do. And there's a certain responsibility on your part to at least, you, you shouldn't try to convince them to do science because that is not your job. Mm -hmm. It is your job to expose the areas in science and see if they get interested. But do it in such a way that a good number of them actually think, oh my God, science is interesting, so let me follow it. So to that extent, yes, you have this added responsibility in a liberal arts and science institute, which you probably didn't have, which I didn't have in maybe Aisar Mohali. And the only thing I had to do there was to help them decide between math, physics, chemistry, and biology. So here, I think uh, sometimes the students complain that, uh, or especially those who did not continue chemistry, is that uh, they uh, they were intimidated by the chemical formula and the balancing of equations. And, um, and in their mind, at least, they think that that is the essence of chemistry. Mm -hmm. That And so if one is not comfortable doing that, then probably the subject is not for them. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with it? Yeah, or? I fully agree with it. I fully sympathize with the students on that. And I think uh, very early in their science education or chemistry education, they do get the impression and, not very, uh, and they're not wrong about it, that chemistry is one of mugging or memorizing formulas and memorizing equations and how to balance them and, and so on. And they are also intimidated by the many empirical rules that we impose for them. And with each rule having a number of exceptions, so you're not even sure if that's a rule by itself. And this surely you know, intimidates them in their choice of chemistry. And very often you'll see students believing that there's a lot more logic in mathematics and physics mm -hmm. than there is in chemistry and biology. Right. And that's the reason why if you talk to students soon after school, you'll find a large number of them actually wanting to do physics and mathematics and very few doing wanting to do chemistry or biology. But that is simply because the way they have learned the subject. You can't blame anybody for it because the subject, you know, does involve certain memorization, certain, a certain commitment to memory of certain concepts. But at the same time, it's also a responsibility to show the beauty of chemistry in it, how chemistry can be very you know, gainfully used in understanding many of our day-to-day -day problems and so on. And if that is done, the memorizing the of the equations and so on would not be such a big burden, would not even be an issue for them, because they know that is not the real chemistry. Memorizing equations is basically a way of bookkeeping. Equations are just a way of bookkeeping chemistry. That's not chemistry in itself. The chemistry actually below, you know, asks the question as to why does a reaction go in a certain way, 
what is the you know can i speed it up can i slow it down and so on so the the more fundamental questions that we ask is the more important issue are the more important issues rather than memorizing the equation itself which is only a way <coughs> of bookkeeping that and that that has to be told to them mm-hmm. so this is not what chemistry is about chemistry is really the understand asking the question the why and how or why a reaction happens in a certain way why does a molecule have a certain property can i relate it to structure can i modify the structure and therefore modify the property if chemistry is portrayed that way i'm very sure it will be a lot more interesting and of course once they get to college and so on you know chemistry is portrayed in many places you know many places uh, they do teach chemistry that way and therefore i think students get to get interested in chemistry at that point but yes at the point where they have to decide about taking chemistry they are intimidated by what they have already learned mm-hmm. and therefore the entrance level courses that colleges have should address this point that how do you take the fear out of their minds with regard to uh, memorization of equations and so on i think in your article you mentioned about how uh, some of the greatest contributions in chemistry are in the materials chemistry uh, mm-hmm. the new materials that are uh, that were designed by chemistry and yeah. you probably failed that <laughs> enough in the common curriculum yes yeah the materials chemistry is a very absolutely important aspect of uh, science that we study and there are departments of material science and so on there's, there's no question that the subject has received its importance but at the very early stage of the education of chemistry when you teach students chemistry this may be, this should be emphasized mm-hmm. that there is so much of this connect between the actual chemistry the molecular structures and so on and the properties of materials and then chemistry does become a lot more interesting a lot more logical and you would find students uh, taking up studies of such research topics because they just seems to be so much logic now and what they have seen so specifically mentioned about a stainless steel i think uh, ss316 which has a particular combination of molybdenum yeah. Uh, yeah. and which has uh, really helped with the properties of the material properties of the steel yeah. and made it more uh, resistant, resistant to corrosion and mm-hmm. so on yeah that is something that many industries use so okay. a normal stainless steel mm. which has got chromium uh nickel mm. in addition to iron being the main component of it mm. and some minor uh, trace elements and carbon and so on has certain properties but if you want to alter the properties that's where chemistry comes you know you add some amount of molybdenum in it and then that material becomes extremely corrosion resistant so if you want to do chemistry involving very strong acids and so on then the type of steel that we just mentioned you know where we have this added component of molybdenum becomes very very uh, useful but chemistry has provided that solution right by way of understanding what happens when you put molybdenum in there and how it uh, enhances the property of corrosion resistance of the stainless steel so that way the you know, material science you know has progressed i mean has gained a lot from very fundamental chemistry concepts you also mentioned about the titanic uh... yeah that's a very that's quite an interesting thing and there are many articles on the titanic uh-huh. the titanic of course hit the iceberg and uh, shattered itself right uh, but then it did so because it at that time the best steels that were available to them was were steels that would turn brittle at very low temperatures right. so when the titanic was traveling in the icy waters of the atlantic that night that fateful night it was actually exposed to temperatures well below its uh, transition temperature so it had become from ductile to brittle mm-hmm. so the moment it hit the iceberg iceberg was the uh, culprit but the fact that the steel couldn't stand that and shattered itself Uh, is the reason as to why the disaster was of that magnitude but today we know we understand that problem and today we have steels that actually uh, stay ductile even at that icy temperatures and therefore it's unlikely that uh, a disaster of that magnitude would occur mm-hmm. for that reason right so that's where again uh, chemistry and its contribution to material science has helped in the design of new materials and the design of new uh, uh, types of transport vessels I suppose another important contribution and I think that has been a recent Nobel prize also uh, is about the battery material mm-hmm. like how the batteries can be longer lasting yeah but again yeah the, again these things would come from you know contribution that chemistry makes in terms of understanding the actual chemistry going on in the battery and how the materials uh, lifetime is enhanced or you know uh, shortened by the chemistry that is taking place and once you understand that you know you can always design systems that will be much long lasting and therefore uh, the batteries of much better lifetime and much better quality
can be produced. Again, there's a give and take between chemistry and material science. One interesting thing that happens, and I don't know how you see it, is that uh, recently quite a few of the, for example, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry actually goes to topics which one can say is biology. For example, the ribosome structure, uh, if I'm right, I think yeah. was given Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Yeah. Uh, of course, these two subjects has, has a very tight connection, and yeah. this is probably reflected here. So... How do you see this trend? I mean, do you do you think that it, this, this should have been a, a different category or? No, I, I it... welcome that sort of uh, outlook that we have today, you know. In fact, the example that you gave about ribosome structure, that is Venki Ramakrishnan's uh, Nobel Prize winning work, 2009, I guess. Keep in mind that uh, Venki Ramakrishnan was a physicist by mm. training. He worked on a problem in biology. Right. And got a Nobel Prize in chemistry. You can't get more interdisciplinary than this. <laughs> but that's perfectly fine. I've always held this. Even just a little while ago when I was talking to students, and uh, when, when, when people come to me and say, look, I'm interested in biology, I'm interested in chemistry also, what should I do, what should I take? I said, look, it all depends on your interest. But I would always advocate people taking, approaching biology through physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain things that you learn from physics and chemistry that would be immensely useful for you in biology. And therefore, it is important to study these as groups of uh, subjects. And today, if the world looks at these topics as one, and therefore, a, you know, a work in biology is offered a Nobel Prize in chemistry, which is perfectly fine. And that is simply because uh, biologists today look at problems at the molecular level, mm -hmm. which, is the, which is right down the alley of uh, chemists. And therefore, we basically are looking at chemical methods into looking at biological problems. And therefore, it is hard to... Uh, you know, discern between what is chemistry and what is biology. I think, therefore, one should completely ignore this difference. Mm -hmm. As long mm -hmm. as the uh, topic is very important, the topic is of uh, extremely good class of research, and they get awarded the prize either in biology or chemistry or physics, it just doesn't matter. <clears throat> See, we've always said that, you know, this, these are classifications that we made for ourselves, mm. you know, as physics, chemistry, and biology. In the example that everybody gives, you know, when plants do photosynthesis, they don't call themselves as physicists or chemists and biologists and then do photosynthesis. But we people call ourselves physicists, chemists and biologists and try to understand what photosynthesis is. Mm -hmm. So that's the classification which we have made. And that is simply because of the inability of man, a human being, to understand all of it in one, in, as one whole piece. So we take little parts of it and try to understand from a certain lens which is perfectly fine, yeah, and that's the way it has to be. But it is perfectly fine that all these people get together at some point and there is give and take between physics, chemistry, and biology. And if a physicist gets a Nobel Prize in chemistry or biology, I think it's perfectly fine. So speaking of physics, I think uh, one interesting example that you gave is about the electronic <coughs> revolution when the semiconductors and how the semiconductor industry depends on pure silicon. Yes. That, yes. Uh, yeah, again, chemistry there has helped a in an enormous way because you need to produce ultra pure silicon or the mm -hmm. base material. Mm -hmm. So the production of ultra pure silicon is again something that chemists taught us how to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and then to dope them with the right amounts of the impurities to get the properties that we want, and then to do a characterization of the concentration of these doped elements is again something that comes from chemistry and maybe sometimes from physics. So again, chemistry has contributed through techniques to make the material, techniques to characterize the material, and so on. And that's where the give and take between chemistry and physics occurs. And that's where I said that, uh, you know, chemistry has contributed enormously to the electronics revolution. You mentioned about, uh, I think, in, uh, I don't know if it's a, if you'd call it a new field or it's an extension of the physics part, which is the atmospheric chemistry. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think it was, a, um, it became a global conversation once uh, um, the ozone depletion was identified and what is the cause for this. And then uh, the banning of substances like freon yeah. that uh, kind of now, I think largely, and the Kyoto Protocol and largely because of which I think the ozone layer has healed, I think that's uh, the understanding currently. So, so 
I think it's a new science field altogether that is the atmospheric chemistry yeah. and uh, it will probably be more important in the coming years. Yeah, I think if you really look at it, the atmosphere probably one of the biggest laboratories that right. you can think of. It's sitting right up above us and a whole lot of chemical reactions go on there. So it's an extremely large laboratory that is there above us and very important uh, uh, laboratory because many of the implications of the chemistry that goes on there affects us directly. And therefore, it is very important for us to take care of this laboratory. And that is what atmospheric chemistry is all about. So when, again, chemistry did a good job there in helping the uh, helping us to understand, you know, the process of ozone depletion and so on. Because actually, I think that's an absolutely brilliant work that uh, Molina, Kurtzen, and uh, I forget the third name, uh, who actually showed us that the ozone depletion mechanism actually occurs through these uh, halocarbons mm -hmm. and uh, how the actual mechanism, you know, using where the ice particles act as the catalyst and then the, the light in early spring does the photochemistry, eventually causing the depletion of ozone. That's a very interesting part of chemistry and chemical kinetics that right. uh, one has to uh, understand to see exactly how this ozone depletion occurs. And it was good that it was done. And it's not an easy problem because to actually pinpoint that the halocarbons doing this job, given that there are so many other compounds present in the atmosphere, I think it was not an easy job to do, but they did, but it was very well delineated. And uh, as a result of that today, we have been able to take precautionary methods, we have been taking take correct, corrective measures. And as a result of that, I think the ozone depletion has been reversed to a, to a small, to some extent. Of course, there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, but at least the, uh, the the ball has been set rolling and there have been so many protocols, the Kyoto Protocol, Montreal Protocol and so on. But it, uh, it, it's nice that what the scientists did actually could percolate to the politicians who could then bring in regulations to implement the, uh, uh, the various protocols to restore the health of the atmosphere. But the initial contribution, I think, came from science and that was very important. Do you think at a local context, and this is something that I often wonder that, so for example, I mean, of course, you are familiar with the pollution in Delhi uh, and the cities like that, which uh, some of it is not localized in the sense the cause is not localized within Delhi. So it might be very difficult to solve it at an administrative or logistic <laughs> level. So banning, banning of um, diesel vehicles may not entirely solve the problem because if the source is from outside. Do you think that, I, I cannot imagine what the technology will be, but do you think any chemical technology can actually work as a carbon sequestration or carbon or uh, toxic gas sequestration mechanism? That I can... think to come up with a molecule that will sequester these, yeah. that I think is not too difficult. I think one can always, and there are maybe molecules already we know that can do it. But how are you going to implement this on a huge area where this can be done. Right. And as you said rightly in the beginning that it is not a local problem. Right. It's a very widespread problem. And mm. to be able to sequester this from many, many hundreds and thousands of square kilometers, the yeah. implementation of that actual sequestering, that would be an issue. And I don't know how that will actually pan out to be. Right. When when you kind of walk into the class, how do you, how do you first get the attention of the students? What is that magic to... Uh, for the students to start liking and paying attention to chemistry? See, it's very important to start any topic by first telling them as to where they might use it. Mm -hmm. They have to know, you know, what am I studying this for? And that is extremely important. And having done that, you, you start the topic, uh, you know, on a rather easy note. You know, don't badger them with too much of a complicated concept right away. Let them get into the topic. So the first few classes must be rather simple, and uh, and at every point trying to tell the you know try to tell them why are you studying this? You know what are you? What's your whole learning objective? That's the, which we talk about in pedagogy. Learning objective, making that very clear, I think is extremely important because once they get the hang of that, the topic will become interesting to them, and then they will start uh, listening to that. Once you have caught them. And a couple of lectures later, you very slowly up the uh, tempo of your lectures, up the content, you know, bring in more profound concepts and make it make it difficult at that point. But they will listen to you because now they have got into the subject. They will listen to you. 
Sometimes what we might do is, you know, on day one, we start with the most difficult concept and so on, and we lose them right there. Then they're never going to get back. So it is important that you first, your first few classes are rather simple, very interesting, telling them where they will be using it and so on and so forth. Give some very real life examples on where they could use it. And once they have latched on to the subject, then you increase the tempo and the, uh, the level of the subject. Because it's very important that while you teach the concepts in a very simple way, don't stick to that simple way forever. Because mm -hmm. then you are diluting the subject. Right. At the expense of, you know, uh, you know under the pretext of making the subject very interesting and very uh, straight, easy to learn, you can't dilute the concepts. So at some point, you have to up the tempo and the, le the level of the class so that they really get to learn the intricate uh, details of the course. But do it in a very progressive manner. And that is how I think I've always seen any course. Slow wrapping and then going up to a level. This is something that I think we have uh, extensive debates about is that, so for a chemistry student, it's of course important to learn the physics and the mathematics part yeah. of it. There are usually many setups uh, for example, of many institutions, which kind of focuses on this particular combination without much of a choice that the students have to uh, maybe major in chemistry with minor in uh, mathematics and physics. And they are all very important. A liberal arts university, liberal arts and science university like Korea, they have the choice of maybe not having that much of mathematics, maybe not having that much of physics. Uh, maybe someone takes up more of um, psychology for argument's sake. So do you think that hampers the education? Because at the at the end of the day, the time is limited. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a fixed period of time, undergraduate education, in which the knowledge has to be imparted. But uh, how do you see there a contradiction that too much choice is bad for the amount of or the quantum of education that can be imparted, uh, quantum of chemistry education that can be imparted, or that choice, uh, it doesn't bother you that much. You think the students can really, uh, if they're interested, they can still thrive, even if they do not know all the mathematics or the physics that should have gone into yeah. the education. The question is, a, is a one little, it's somewhat hard to answer because when you say too much choice, what is too much to be called too much is one issue. Mm -hmm. But anyway, See, it depends on what the student wants to do. Supposing a psychology student says, mm -hmm. I want to study the, the basic chemistry courses, just a few of them. Mm -hmm. Then I think the choice should be left to the student. You, you take, you know, one, of, one or some of these courses because that person isn't going to be a chemist. Right. The person is going to be a psychologist, but for some reason mm -hmm. uh, feels that he or she needs to understand chemistry. And therefore, you should just inform the student that these are the courses that are available to you and leave it to them, you know, at some point. But if somebody wants to do a chemistry major, right, uh, then you have to, one, because now we are ex we're expecting to have this person go into chemical, you know, research or teaching or whatever. And therefore, this person must be well-trained in most of the basic concepts in chemistry. Mm -hmm. So this person, therefore, must not have as much choice in the mm -hmm. sense that they must have certain courses that they must take. Mm -hmm. But of course, they also have electives, which, which is going to be based on their likes and dislikes. But there are certain basic courses that these people must take if you're going to call yourself a chemistry major. You can't say, I'm going to be a chemistry major and not do any quantum chemistry or not do any thermodynamics and get away with it. No. Mm -hmm. There are courses that you must take. And But as the way we do it, you know, we also have a minor, but mm -hmm. then you're not going to be a chemistry major, but you're doing a physics, but you want to learn certain concepts in chemistry. So we give you a few courses and then you can take again electives based on what your interests are. So I think the choices that they have should be should be based on what their major areas of studies are and how they want to uh, use chemistry eventually. So as I say, you know, if for a psychology person, just tell them, oh, these are the courses, you do whatever you want, because they're not going to be chemists. They just want to say this person says, I'm very thrilled about organic chemistry. I want to do organic chemistry. Okay, take it. Not an issue. But uh, a chemistry major cannot say, look, I am interested in organic chemistry and that's all I want to study. Right. Suppose I uh, kind of turn the question and for a chemistry major, if they decide to do a minor in philosophy or history, would you say that their chemical education is incomplete because in principle they could have done maybe a minor in physics, which would have been more helpful? because these subjects are more tightly coupled. 
Yeah, I, but I would still think as long as they, they, they do a major in chemistry and they take all the necessary courses in chemistry, I'm okay with it. It would have, the way I have been trained, mm -hmm. I would be uh, tempted to think that they should have done physics. But this person wants to do uh, psychology or he wants to do something else. So I think it should be okay. Because I have a feeling once this person has the basic training in chemistry and tomorrow wants to do something in chemistry and not in psychology or whatever, right. and then suddenly feels the need for some physics or mathematics, this person will probably do it at that time. Right. And still, you know, complete his or her education. Right. So I think choices like these must be allowed. Excepting that, if they're going to call themselves as majors, particularly, mm -hmm. and that's where I'm really, you know, I want to be careful on. Mm. If you want to call yourself as major, then it's a basic education that you must receive. Right. What you take in your electives and other things, you, know, you can, they, they can be counseled. But at the end of the day, if they want to do something extremely different, mm -hmm. so be it. I have no issues with that. So if a chemistry major wants to do economics as a minor, which is perfectly fine. Right. Maybe this guy will become an entrepreneur. Right. And, uh, you know, the maths or the physics that they would have otherwise taken mm. uh, is not going, they're not having that wouldn't hamper them because they are very different in their, their way of thinking. Right. So that is fine. So, uh, but... When it comes to majors, I think when the majors, you must be careful in what they what they learn. But that basic training must be there. Another thing which I don't know how you, I mean, of course, you have been part of the uh, instructors for uh, the course that we offer scientific reasoning. And one can say, okay, scientific reasoning is related to chemistry. So I think the students are exposed to that uh, kind of scientific <coughs> thinking already. But then there are, of course, the first year courses, which are... Um, common to all the students, they also uh, go to exploring social and historical aspects, to philosophical perspectives, and to literature and arts. So, and also it takes up, again, uh, quite a bit of time in the first year. So, uh, how do you, so do you think it adds anything of value to the chemistry education? Does it, does it help? Does it speed up something? Or it's, um, it's, kind of a delay that has to be compensated later in the in our curriculum, chemistry curriculum. Honest example. answer, I don't know. Okay. Because this is too early in the day to even comment on it one way or the other. I don't know. Uh, one could look at it as saying that, look, these people are getting an education that is going to be wholesome. Mm -hmm. sense, they look at science, they also look at non-science aspects, you know, aspects other than science. That's what I meant by non-science aspects. And that might help them in the in the long run because they they have developed a way of thinking that is uh, extremely wholesome. But then the, the the question can also be argued, you know, that we have lost some time in the first year that they could have used up in the uh, chemical education. But I think that's where I think we'll have to see how this goes on over a period of time as to how this actually unravels. And uh, if students who are graduating from this type of an education eventually find, you know, uh, the the right opportunities to enhance their career, then we are not doing anything wrong. Mm. But if we find later on, you know, that there are, you know, that we are probably not teaching them enough science because we only do it for two years and that is hurting us, mm -hmm. then I think we should uh, sit down and rethink on this whole issue. Right. Uh, the, the, I think the important thing is to be very open on this issue and not completely closed on right. all uh, ideas saying that, oh, this is a waste of time and they shouldn't be doing it. That's one extreme which is wrong. At the same time, oh, this is perfectly fine. We shouldn't even be worrying about it, and they this is what they should be doing. Right. That is wrong, too. I think we should keep playing by the year and seeing how to tweak this and so on and be very open to the fact that this actually could lead to a very wholesome way of thinking for the students. I suppose this is also where the whole debate about the three-year undergraduate education versus a four-year undergraduate education will come in because if it's a four-year program, then I think there is more leeway, more elbow room to yeah. accommodate uh, this whole If it's a four-year four course, then that first year, hmm. no, they're not doing science, won't hamper us at all. Right. Because then we can readjust the courses right. to do this. But if the fourth year is an option, right. then you have to be careful. Because right. when the students leave after the third year, then you only have given them two years of education. Right. And you must make sure that in those two years, you have given them enough hmm. to call themselves as uh, majors in chemistry and that they have been taught enough that they have learned all the necessary concepts in chemistry by way of both theory and laboratory. Keep right. this in mind that laboratory is a very important component of any science education. Right. Uh, physics, science, and biology at the end of the day are experimental sciences, and right. therefore we should have very strong laboratory components 
and we should see whether we can pack both the theory and the laboratories in these two years for them. If the four four year option is for everybody, I don't know whether that's an issue or not. But if then our courses can be very easily shifted in such a way hmm. that they do one year of uh, you know skill courses and they do three years of uh, science and they would be essentially be getting all the our three year undergraduates were getting earlier in other systems. I think it's it, it depends on how things go. But I think either way, I think we can still tailor the courses in such a way that uh, whether it is a three-year course and the fourth year as an option, this is the way we are looking at it right now. Mm. And we have set up the courses in such a way that when they leave with three years of uh, undergraduate education, they still get the necessary training that they have in chemistry. In the fourth year, we have just kept it as more of an experimental training right. with a few courses right. so that when they go out, they turn out to be good experimental uh, scientists. Not that we are, we are, uh, we want them to become experimentalists. They could mm. well be theorists. Right. But even if you are a theorist, I think it is important to know how experiments are done. Right. And therefore, that's a good training. Speaking of experiments, I think uh, some of your laboratory experiments were quite popular with students. The oscillating reaction, I think you performed ah, yes. in the class. And yeah. Chemiluminescence also. Yeah, we did chemiluminescence. I think these are all very standard experiments, but it uh, never ceases to thrill the students when right. they see it. Right. But the more important thing is not just showing the equation, showing the reaction and being done with it. I think it's very important to very, on the sly, explain all the concepts behind it. Right. So that, you know, while they're still being, you know, enthralled and stunned by the beauty of these reactions, right. you very slowly slip in all the concepts so that when they go away, they go away with the excitement of having seen a very wonderful reaction, plus the concepts that drive these reactions. And that's very important. So, yeah, we did uh, the briggs rosher the oscillation reaction, the we did uh, biochemiluminescence and so on, and the chemical volcano. Oh, they are very standard reactions. But as I said, you, you can do it uh, at a randomly drawn bunch of students and you will not find a single group which is not enthralled by it. Okay. Speaking of the um, the research uh, or the laboratory aspect and research, and I know that your research, in order to discuss it, it will take an entire an, an entire episode by itself. But I was just wondering that uh, one thing that intrigued me about um, uh, about your description of your work when you say that the you could achieve an enhancement of fluorescence of about a factor of ten thousand. Uh, yeah. This is a molecular spectroscopy component. Could you? Uh, Elaborate a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we were looking at fluorescence of uh, lanthanides like terbium, dysprosium, and europium. Okay. And uh, very often people study the lanthanides because they are good uh, forerunners for actinides. Okay. It's hard to study the actinides uh, straight off the bat because actinides are radioactive. So you study the lanthanides because one is the 4F block and the other one is the fiber block. So you study the lanthanides. And then try to take these concepts and then go to the actinides after having understood and you know standardized many of the methods. So in that sense, while we were really interested in the actinides, we studied the lanthanides first, and we were looking at ways of improving the fluorescence efficiency of these compounds, because fluorescence is a very good analytical method. But then many of these uh, lanthanides don't. You know, while they have a fluorescence, they are not enough to uh, be able to estimate them at extremely low levels of concentration. When I say low levels, I'm talking of a few parts per million and so on. I would like to estimate them at that concentration. So you need to come up with methods to enhance the fluorescence. So which means you have to figure out what are the reasons as to why these molecules don't fluoresce as well as you would want them to. There could be many reasons, you know, that the absorption is not strong enough, or they are very quickly deactivated from their excited states and so on. So if, if you know what the real reason is as to why the fluorescence is not very good, then you can try ways to get around that problem. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we took these lanthanides and we put them along with some organic molecules which, which they complex. And since the lanthanides were not absorbing that great, we made the organic molecules absorb, which were doing very strongly, and then transferring their energy to the lanthanides. So we were not ex exciting the lanthanides, we were exciting the, the molecule, which was right next to it, it which was the complex was being made. And these molecules were then transferring the energy to the lanthanides and causing the excitation. So this roundabout method, which is called ligand sensitization, actually turns out to be a lot more efficient than trying to excite the lanthanides directly. 
And then we also found out that these lanthanides can, you know, lose their energy because of collisions with water very easily. So even after exciting this and we got the enhancement, we were still not doing the best because a good number of the more, um, fluoros, I mean the atom that we had like ions which we had excited, were losing their energy to this non-radiative or uh, unproductive process. So we put them in a nice cage, you know, micellar cage, where the water was excluded. And then we found that the combination of this energy transfer from the ligand plus the, uh, the cage effect of these micelles increased the fluorescence by a whole lot, you know, almost like a factor of 10,000. We even achieved, I think, even higher, like 50,000 to a, to a lakh by using ionic liquids as a possible method by which to do this energy transfer and so on. And how different are the incident lights, the wavelength of the incident light and the fluorescence range ah, the, that you scan? Uh, the absorption, now absorption. it's not the ligand, uh, lanthanide absorption. Right. Now it's the uh, organic molecule absorption, which is generally in the UV. Okay, so... But the emission is still the same. Okay. So all this caging and other things, doesn't affect the uh, the the emission uh, frequency. It's still at, at the same layer points where it where it is. So I give it as uh, europium, for example. I think it's around six hundred and fourteen nanometers or thereabout. Okay. It continues to be at six hundred and fourteen nanometers because those are not affected by these ligands. The energy levels are not so affected by these ligands. They're quite insulated. Okay. Uh, but then, because of the fact that the water molecules now can't get in because I have caged them, they they tend to uh, fluoresce much better. And therefore, you will find enhancements of the order of uh, 10 to 50,000, which therefore means that I can now estimate lower concentrations of this material because the fluorescence is that much more efficient. And also, I believe that they can be used for some very interesting applications, maybe biological imaging. Or... Surely, yeah. I think wherever you're looking at fluorescence of these uh, lanthanides as a tool, right? yes, these methods would come in very, very handy. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Vishwanathan. It My was pleasure. a wonderful... It was nice talking to you. Thank nice you. talking to you. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Yeah. And uh, thanks for uh, listening to this podcast on science pedagogy. And hopefully we'll meet in the next episode.